Convex is not just a wrapper around Postgres or MySQL. It's doing something much deeper and, in my opinion, kind of brilliant. For example, let's take a look at this simple shopping app here. I can sign in and then add an item to my cart and you'll see the number of the items remaining goes down immediately. But if I open up another tab, you can see that the UI instantly updates as I add or remove things from the cart. It's a really nice experience for both the user and the developer. But the real question is, how does Convex actually make all of this work? How can it guarantee that if two people try and buy the very last item at exactly the same time, then one will succeed and the other one will fail, but yet still keep this entire system running really, really fast and keep it massively scalable? Well, the answer is actually really kind of surprising as it flips the way you normally think about databases on its head. So in this video, we're gonna be diving deep into the Convex internals, taking a look at this database structure, looking at transactions and subscriptions, and try and uncover exactly how Convex works. I think this is gonna be a really interesting one, so uh, make sure you grab yourself a lovely cup of tea, settle in, and let's dive into how Convex really works. So that shopping app that I showed you in the demo there is a modified version of something called the Swag House, which is an app, a demo app, that the Convex CTO, James, had done previously. So as you saw in the intro, we can add and remove items from the shopping cart. And once there are no items left, the item disappears on the list. So let's dive into the code for this application. So we can see that we have our web app stuff, which is all living in the source directory here. And then we also have the convex folder, which contains the convex source code. When we deploy our front end code, it goes to a hosting provider like Netlify, Vercel, or something like that. Whereas our convex code is gonna be pushed to the convex cloud. That convex code gets pushed whenever we run convex deploy or convex dev, which is basically the same as convex deploy, but with some file watching. Okay, so now that our code is hosted, when our web browser opens a connection to get the page swaghouse.com, it's gonna to go to Netlify, which is gonna return back the HTML and JavaScript for that page. The browser is then gonna render that code, which is then going to cause the convex client to open a WebSocket to your convex deployment running in the convex cloud. Right, so that's the basics, but I think it's a little bit too high level. So let's crack open this Convex deployment and have a look what's inside. Oh wow, yeah, so there's a, there's a bunch more stuff in here. I think the best way to tackle this might be to start off simple. Let's have a look what our deployment would look like at rest. That is, right after we first deployed, but it hasn't got any traffic yet. So to aid us in this understanding, let's have a quick look at the Convex code in this project, starting with the schema for the database. So it's pretty simple. We have two tables, items. These are the shop items that you can buy. Each item has a name, description, price, image, and the number of them that are remaining. Then we have cart items. So these record which items exist in a user's cart. Both tables also define an index for efficient querying. Talking about querying, let's take a look at one of the queries here. Pretty basic. So the list items query returns shopping list items that have at least one of that remaining. And also just note at this point that there's no manual synchronization logic that we need to run here to have this query update when the items update. Hold on to that thought, it's gonna be important later. Speaking of updating though, let's have a look at the code that is run when you click the button to add an item to your cart. So this is a convex mutation that takes an item ID, a user token, in this case will be just the username. It then grabs the item to check to see whether there's enough of that remaining. It then looks to see if the user has already added this item to their cart. And if they haven't, then it gets added with a count of one. Otherwise, it just increments the count of the item in that cart. And finally, we decrement the remaining count so that others can't add it to the cart too if there's none remaining. All right, so now we have a basic understanding I think it's gonna be important for us to have a look at see how Convex actually goes about storing this data. One way we could go about doing that is to pop our project into local development mode by running npx convex dev with the dash dash local flag. The first time this runs, this is going to download the binary version of the Convex backend and boot it up. So the local version of Convex stores its data in an SQLite file in the home directory. So we can just crack that open up with a SQLite database browser. So the first thing you'll notice on the schema tab here is that there's only four tables, documents, indices, persistence globals, and read only. 
Note that there's no mention of items or cart items in here. See, this is a common misunderstanding of Convex. Even though Convex gives you a schema for your tables and uses relational database under the covers, in this case, SQLite, but in the cloud it's Postgres or, or MySQL, it doesn't actually use the database's underlying concept of tables for storage. So it's not just a wrapper around Postgres or MySQL or whatever. So the question is then, how does Convex actually store the data? Well, let's pop open the Browse tab here and make sure we're looking at the Documents table. And looking at the data, we can see a big old collection of JSON objects here. And scrolling to the bottom reveals what appears to be one of our item documents. It's got the name, the description, and the items remaining on it. It also includes the two automatically added convex fields, creation time and ID. This view is kind of hard to understand what's going on though, so let's hop into a diagram and see if we can break it down a bit. So what we were looking at just then is what's known as the transaction log. You can kind of think of it like an immutable list of all the changes that happened inside of your convex database. It stores all of the documents keyed against a timestamp rather than the ID of the document, like you might be used to seeing in a relational database. So here, for example, at timestamp 13, we have just the hovercraft item. Then at timestamp 14, we have the hat item added with 11 remaining. And then in the same timestamp, we have a cart item added with a count of one. So now let's imagine what would happen if we added uh, another hat to our cart. So at timestamp 15, we decrement the remaining number of hats and increment the count of that item in the cart and assign both of those documents to the next timestamp 15. It's important to note that because both of these changes happen at the same timestamp, they are applied atomically. This means that the database can never be in an in-between state where we have added the item to the cart but not decremented the remaining count left. So just to summarize, Every single action in our Convex database, whether it's inserting, updating, deleting, pushes an entry into this transaction log. And pushing multiple changes at the same time allows us to batch them up into a single atomic unit. Okay, so now the transaction log really is very much a minimalist data structure. It only supports appending some entries to the end of the log and also querying entries at a given timestamp. This, however, isn't powerful enough for us to access our data efficiently from within our convex queries. To make querying efficient, we need indexes which are built on top of the log. So, to look up documents by the ID field, an index is maintained that maps each ID to its latest value. Whenever something is pushed onto the transaction log, the index is updated to point at our latest revision. So you can kind of think of the transaction log as an immutable source of truth, whereas the index is our derived data that we modify over time to help us efficiently find the document's latest version. There's an issue with this, however, as it turns out that it's useful to also support queries for multiple versions in the recent past. So our index also needs to support versioning. So now the index records a view of the entire database at a given timestamp. So you can see here that the hovercraft doesn't actually change from timestamp 13, 14, or 15. So the index is always pointing to the same item in the transaction log. Whereas the hat and the cart item change between timestamp 14 and 15. So they point to a different entry in the log. Okay, phew, I hope you're still with me at this point because we're now gonna build on some of this to have a look at how Convex is able to leverage this way of storing data to allow for massive scale. Now, Let's imagine that there is only one hat left in our store, and there are two users, Alice and Bob, that both try to add it to their cart at exactly the same time. So the question is, who gets the hat? Well, if the database was single-threaded, then it would be pretty easy to solve. It would basically be whoever entered the queue first. So in this case, Alice would enter first, her mutation would run first, securing her the hat, and then Bob's mutation would run which would cause an error because there's no items left. And this would work, but <laughs> as you can imagine, this is not gonna be particularly performant as each new mutation that gets added gets pushed to the bottom of the queue and has to wait for the ones above it to be executed before that one can run. So what we need to do instead is to be able to have these mutations somehow run in parallel. 
But let's take a look what happens if we try and do that. So Alice comes in, starts executing the mutation. Bob does exactly the same thing at the same time. They both see that there's one item left, so they both add it to their cart. Then they get down here and then they both decrement the number of items remaining. So if we follow this through, we're going to see that we're going to end up with negative one hats remaining, which is going to leave the folks over in the warehouse pretty annoyed and probably one of our customers upset. So we're kind of stuck with two competing goals here. We want to be able to run multiple mutations concurrently, but we don't want to have to reason about how concurrent function calls interact with each other. I'm just going to cut to the chase here because the missing piece is transactions. Transactions extend the idea of uh, an atomic batch of writes in our, tra in our transaction log to include both reads and writes. And in Convex, all queries and mutations interact through the database exclusively through transactions. Let's have a look at how that is going to apply for our example. So Alice and Bob are going to execute this mutation at the same time. To keep things simple, let's just walk through what's going to happen for Alice first. So the first thing that happens is a transaction is going to get created with a timestamp of 16. Then the first thing that the mutation is going to do is look up the item ID from the database and that read is going to get added to our read set in the transaction. So the mutation sees that there's one hat left. So we're going to move down to the bit where we increase the number of items in our cart. Note though, instead of making that change immediately to the database, we're going to add that write to our write set in our transaction. The same thing goes for the decrement of the remaining count of the item document. Okay, now after all of that, we have a transaction at timestamp 16 with two things in its read set and two things in its write set. And don't forget, because Bob executed this at exactly the same time, he has exactly the same looking transaction. Now, that Trans that finalized transaction is passed to the next part, which is called the committer. Its job, as you might have guessed, is to work out whether it's safe to commit this to the transaction log. Let's have a look how it goes about doing that. So we have our transaction start point here at timestamp 16. Now let's imagine that while Alice's and Bob's mutations were running, two other timestamps came into the transaction log, 17 and 18. So. The committer can check whether it's safe to commit our transaction to timestamp 19, which is the next one in the transaction log, by answering the question, would the transaction have exactly the same outcome if it was executed at 19 instead of 16? And we could do that by having a look and seeing whether any of the writes that happened in between overlap with our transaction's read set. So does the item ID in transaction 17 match the item ID in the read set? Or how about the one in transaction 18? Does this cart item in transaction 18 overlap with the index range in the, our transactions read set? If it's no to both of these, then the committer knows that it's safe to add this transaction at timestamp 19 instead of when it started at timestamp 16. If, however, we did find that there was a conflict that happened in between the times, then we have to abort and retry this transaction. And this means that Alice is going to have to retry her mutation by running it again, except instead of being at timestamp 16, it's now started at timestamp 19. And it's safe to do this because convex mutations forbid any sort of side effects. So that means that they are entirely deterministic. So this means that when the mutation runs, there's no changes to the file system. We haven't called any external services. It's literally just a deterministic set of changes. By the way, this abort and retry process is called an optimistic currency control error or OCC. You may have seen them from time to time in the convex logs. Now you know. So in our case of Alice and Bob fighting over the last convex hat, because Alice's transaction was submitted to the committer a nanosecond before Bob, her transaction didn't conflict with the existing transactions. Whereas by the time Bob gets down to it, his will have done because Alice's would have been committed first. Therefore, his transaction will get an OCC error, which means that his mutation will run again. And the second time that it runs, it will read that there's no items remaining in the database. Therefore, it will get a return an error and then pop up on the client saying, there's no hats left. Sorry, you can't, you can't add it to your cart. Okay, so at this point, we've learned how Convex uses 
custom-built database to provide a strong consistency and high transaction processing throughput. But there's one more awesome feature that falls out of this architecture naturally. You see, read sets can also be used for implementing real-time updates for queries. Let's have a look at our list items query from before. Queries don't go through the commit protocol, obviously, because they're querying data, but they do have a timestamp and read set. So in this case, the read set might look something like this. It's a query on the items table over the index by remaining with the range where the value is greater than zero. And we can now use this read set to implement subscriptions. So on the client side, when we use use query with our list items function, Convex is going to run this query once the first time, return the data and show it to the user. But it's also going to open up a subscription which says whenever any item in this read set changes, then we're going to rerun this query and return the data to the client over the WebSocket connection. Then under the covers, the subscription is going to get added to the subscription manager, which aggregates all the subscriptions, deduplicates things, and keeps things running really nice and fast as we add thousands, hundreds of thousands, however many subscriptions. Okay, so let's put things all together now. So you load Swaghouse in your browser, which makes a request to Netlify for the HTML and JS. Your page loads the React app, which then starts the Convex client, which opens the WebSocket connection to the Convex deployment. When the items React component mounts, it's going to register a list items query with the Convex client, which is going to send a message on the WebSocket to tell the sync worker to execute this query. The sync worker is going to pass this request along to the function runner. The function runner is internally going to maintain an automatic cache of the recently run functions, and the query is already in the cache, it returns a value immediately. Otherwise, it's going to spin up an instance of the V8 runtime and begin a new transaction and execute the function's JavaScript. When the function executes, it's going to read from various indices in the database and build up the query's read set. After the function has finished executing, it's going to return its value along with the transaction information which contains the timestamp and the read set back to the sync worker, which is then going to pass the result back to the client over the WebSocket. The sync worker is also going to subscribe to the query's read set with the subscription manager, requesting notification whenever the result might change. So that's the read side. Now on the right side, when we click the add to cart button, this is going to trigger a mutation to call the server. Calling the add cart mutation sends a message to the WebSocket to run the specified mutation. The sync worker then passes this message over to the function runner again. The function runner again is going to start a transaction at the specified timestamp. It's then going to make queries to the database and read the indexes as needed. After the function runs, unlike queries, the function is going to return back a transaction to the sync worker that's going to include not just the timestamp, the read set, but also a write set. The sync worker is then going to forward this to the uh, committer, which is going to decide whether it's safe to commit this to a transaction log or not. If, it, if the committer decides it is okay, it's going to get appended to the transaction log, and then it's going to return the result back to the sync worker, which is then going to pass the result of the mutation back down to the client. And since the, our mutation changed some values in the database, our list items query is no longer up to date. So the subscription worker is going to read our new entry from the transaction log, determine that it overlaps with our read set uh, from our previous list items query. The sync worker is then going to tell the function runner to rerun the function and return a result back to the sync worker, which is going to send the new updated value down the WebSocket. And that's pretty much it. As you navigate around the app, subscription is going to keep getting added and removed. We're going to keep running queries. We're going to be checking with the transaction log, the indices, and everything just works. Phew, that was a lot to cover. I hope most of you are still with me. We did cover a lot in this video, but there is still so much more we didn't actually cover. Just a few things we didn't cover is like actions, auth, end-to-end -end type safety, file storage, virtual system tables, scheduling, crons, import, export, text, search, vector search, pagination, and just so much more. So I guess you're going to have to drop me a like and sub uh, or leave me a comment down below if you'd like to see any more of these topics in detail. And if you did like this video, then you might also like this video where I went spelunking through the Convex code base in an attempt to uncover how the automated API generation system works. All right, well, that's about it for me for today. Thanks for watching. Until next time, 
Cheerio.